I'm Chris Murphy. I'm a senior principal software engineer at Red Hat. Um, I work in emerging technology in the CTO office. Um, I lead a team that's focused on computational infrastructure, next gen hardware, next gen architectures, and then the software to manage that. Um, so obviously, DPUs, IPUs land really well um, within that. Um, and I also want to introduce uh, Billy. Um, do you want to introduce yourself, Billy, um, and what you do? Yeah. Um, hey, I'm Billy McFall. Um, I'm also in the Office of CTO. Um, I'm in the networking team um, in Emerging Tech. And um, I've been recently working on integrating DPUs into OpenShift. So um, that's why I'm here. Awesome. Thanks, Billy. So um, to start with, I just want to talk a little bit about open source and how important it is to Red Hat. Um, obviously, we believe highly in open source. We think open source is the innovation for the industry. We think it's the right place for various companies, interested parties, even test vendors and software companies to come together and work on an ecosystem together, right? There's a lot of reasons it's the right place. Um, some simple things like if you try and do it partner to partner and you get more than a couple partners involved, you have to have complex NDAs and lawyers and things to even have conversations. Doing things in open source means you know, that we can have these conversations out in the open. Nobody feels like we're being secretive. Anybody who wants to come join us can come join us, right? Whether they're competitors to competing um, companies or not. For example, you know, Red Hat is completely open to you know, Canonical, VMware, all of our competitors being part of this because we really believe that we um, reduce risk and get to the best products if we work together. Oops, two slides. So enterprise is an, or Red Hat is an enterprise software company, right? But we have always embraced an open source development model. And by that, part of that is Red Hat starts everything in the upstream first, right? We have engineers who work highly with the Linux community, um, with Kubernetes, OpenStack, and various other projects that connect with these things, everything from like OBS and OVN, you know, to all kinds of different things, right? So we work in those communities, not just for our own interests, but we also help a lot of our partners and a lot of other companies to make sure that we're doing things in a way that work for the community, right? Um, often when a partner comes to Red Hat and says, hey, I want to support my adapter in Linux, right? Um, we end up helping them figure out how to get their drivers upstreamed, what needs to happen, and how to integrate with other projects. So we want to bring that expertise to, these ex to this ecosystem and help this thrive too. So I want to talk a little bit about a trend that I see happening in infrastructure and um, then how that applies to what we're doing here. So for the last you know, five to 10 years, cloud providers and um, people have been trying to convince us that infrastructure should be homogeneous. We should man manage it like cattle, not like pets, so that you know, it doesn't require special care. Everything is the same. If one node goes down, you can swap it out with another node. And that has great benefits, but with the end of Moore's law and you know things that are happening in the industry, um, we uh, are getting to more domain specific hardware, right? We are having to bring hardware back into the picture. It's not all the same. You know, we have different breeds of cattle now. We have different colors of cattle, um, right? Because we need these hardware specific things to accomplish um, what we need to accomplish in our systems. So I would argue that this has led to pets masquerading as cattle, right? The performance needs and the demands of our workloads have meant that we are bringing in specialized hardware, but we're still trying to pretend that they're cattle, right? Um, and so Red Hat believes that it's really important that we look at the platforms and we look at the way that we manage hardware and infrastructure and try to come to ways of abstracting some of those hardware um, specialties 
but not losing the value of the specialized hardware. So that is a challenge, right? We've heard a lot from a lot of companies already about the benefits of DPUs and IPUs and how this hardware can bring benefits to your applications. Today, I think Billy and I are gonna focus quite a bit on the challenges that we see here, right? We know that hybrid cloud is a predominant um, operational um, paradigm all the way from edge, private cloud, public cloud, right? Lots of companies are using hybrid cloud and it's super um, important in how they manage their infrastructure. If we look at Red Hat's hybrid cloud, you know, we have, you know, our Linux operating system, we have OpenShift, you know, based on Kubernetes. Um, let's talk just a minute about with DPUs where we get challenges here. So you add a DPU to your server or an IPU or another specialized piece of hardware that has compute capacity on it. Now you have two OSs. If those OSs aren't the same, now you have two different um, validations, testing, and everything to add them to your infrastructure. Plus your um, IT operators need to understand both. They need to know how to integrate things into both. That's complex, that adds complexity. Um, infrastructure is already complex. So it's our belief that we need to try to reduce this by making sure that the OSs that we can use on this infrastructure can be common if necessary between the CPUs and DPU slash IPU layer. So we think that's vital. We also think that customers are used to using Kubernetes and containers, that this is becoming really common. Um, we think that we need to be able to bring that to the DPU IPU infrastructure as well, so that the same interfaces that they're used to, you know, the same APIs, the same management tools can all be used for this, this new um, infrastructure space. But not just needing consistency between the CPU and the DPU layer, but also between the different parts of a hybrid cloud. For example, I think that we see that a bunch of public cloud providers are already adding these kinds of devices into their infrastructure. You can look at what Amazon has done with AWS Nitro. Um, we heard from IBM this morning that IBM Cloud is using DPUs slash smart mix in their infrastructure. So if you're a hybrid cloud user and you have an application, it was developed in public cloud, it was developed on infrastructure that had this kind of hardware offload capability, now, if you want to move that same application into your private cloud, if you don't have IPUs and DPUs and similar hardware there, is your application gonna perform the same? You know, are you gonna have issues? Will it even run correctly? Has it been tested without having those capabilities, right? Then it gets even harder when we're taking it out to the edge and other platforms. So we really believe that, you know, we can't let the cloud, public cloud providers create this in a way that works only within their cloud, right? Because that will lock some of us in to using their services and their services only because some of our applications, some of our processes, some of our tooling won't work across an entire hybrid cloud data center. So it's important that we have a common way to do this across all of these different footprints. So, Part of what Red Hat has already started doing is trying to extend the operational simplicity of DPUs um, or of, of Kubernetes to DPUs, right? Um, some of the benefits are, you know, offloading, you know, infrastructure software so that you get those CPU benefits. You're not using up your CPU resources just to do infrastructure software. And we get to keep the common Kubernetes tooling and experience. And then really important, the common system management, right? Lifecycle management of the different components and things that we want to make sure we're not adding complexity there. So now I wanna turn it over to Billy because Billy has been on a team that has been working with um, a vendor's DPU and trying to integrate it into Kubernetes. And he's gonna talk a little bit about um, some of these things that they've done so far. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so like Chris said, I um, have been working on um, the NVIDIA Bluefield DPUs, um, the Bluefield 2, and trying to get them integrated into OpenShift. 
Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did. I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but I um, want to give you a little bit of context so that when we start getting into some of the challenges, you'll have a little bit of background. And I'll try to give you some um, the challenges that we encountered and then plead the case for OPI and some of these common APIs. All right, Chris, next slide, please. Okay, so um, in some of the previous presentations, um, you've seen some diagrams where they took the vSwitch and dropped it down to the DPU. Um, so that's pretty much what we've done. Um, on a normal host, um, we have um, OVN and then OVN Kubernetes, which is OVN Kubernetes is our CNI run containerized on the host. And then we have uh, OVS running on, as a systemd process. So we've taken all of our networking, OVN, OVS, and OVN Kubernetes and moved it down to the DPU, offloading all the networking, um, saving the CPU cycles and giving us security there. Okay, next slide. We are using SRV to plumb these interfaces into um, the pods running on the host. Um, we're hijacking VF0, um, plumbing it in into um, the host network. So from the OVN, OVN Kubernetes point of view, this is MP0, so it's plugging into our host network. And then we're using the rest of the VFs to um, plug into the pods running on the host. Now, in a normal situation here um, on the left side, um, we have, um, we normally use a VETH pair for this plumbing, where um, the one side of the VETH pair is plugged into OVS and the other side is plugged into the pod. These are for non SRE deployments on the host. Okay, next slide. So our deployment, um, we have a two cluster deployment. Um, we have all the worker nodes um, for the x86 servers running in one cluster. We're calling this the tenant cluster. Then we have a second cluster. And on this second cluster is where we have the DPUs themselves. Um, these DPUs, um, they currently have a set of ARM servers that we're using as master nodes. However, um, going forward, that's just a stopgap. Going forward, we plan to use um, a hypershift deployment where these can, these master nodes are actually running as pods in a hypershift deployment. But we do have a do two um, cluster deployment for our integration of DPUs and OpenShift. All right, next slide. Before we move on, Billy, do you want to talk a little bit about why it needs to be two different clusters? What are the benefits of separating them? Oh uh, yeah, I can go into that a little bit. Um, there's a couple of reasons. Um, so one of them is we, we have an, a layer of security between um, a layer of security between the um, x86 host and the um, DPUs. And we foresee needing to run workloads on the DPU doing things like maybe some pre-filtering service chaining where we want those separate and outside the control of the tenant network. So that's one of the primary reasons. All right, so um, some of the challenges that we encountered. Um, so the first one, um, we received our NICs. I believe they're running Ubuntu. And so we had to get Rail up and running on the DPUs. Um, I believe it was Nicholas from Meta that was talking yesterday. Um, one of his points was the speed at getting boards up with the OS and being able to get traffic flowing um, as quickly as possible. Um, I actually wasn't part of this team working on getting rail up on the DPU, but it was not a one day operation. It was a bit of a feat to get it running. So um, just kind of re-age some of the challenges trying to get these things up and running just to get packets flowing. Um, we're using SRV and it had its challenges. Um, in a normal um, SRV deployment, we have um, a mutating webhook, um, which is fired off by an operator. And this will inject um, into the pod spec the SRV VF information needed to deploy the pod. Um, when we're running um, all of OVS and OVN on the DPU itself, we no longer have OVS running on the host. So as I showed you in the previous one of the previous slides where um, we would normally on non-SRV pods use a VE pair to connect to non-SROV, we no longer have OVS running. So we now have an issue where all of our pods need to be SROV enabled. 
Uh, one of the problems we ran into with OpenShift is we have a handful of operators and currently only the network operator is the one that's um, using the SROV um, webhook, uh, mutating webhook. So we had an option of either going through all of our other operators and trying to retrofit um, all the mutating webhook into them or which is what we chose for short-term solution is just not allow any non-host or non-SRV pods to run on the host. Um, some of the other issues we hit um, trying to offload um, we've got OVS running on the DPU so now we can take OVS flows from the DPU and push them to the NIC directly. Uh, we had some issues with um, getting the offloading to work primarily because some new contract fields were introduced by OVN and OVS didn't support them or the kernel didn't support them. So nothing per se to do with the DPU, but just trying to manage the complexity of all these different layers um, was a pain, um, which leads to the next bullet. Um, we've got a a lot of um, different components running and trying to manage the different patches and software, especially early phases, trying to get stuff up and running, um, trying to manage these, not only the different components, but now we also have to build them for ARM and for x86 and make sure that they both get updated with the set of patches that they need. So um, just trying to manage those during development, um, as well as in the next bullet, um, lifecycle management, um, being able to upgrade these um, components um, in the field. Uh, we're not there yet. We still have a lot of work to do there, but just trying to make sure that um, you have two OSs that need to be upgraded as well as all their components and then synchronizing the two, making sure that um, when you reboot, you wanna minimize downtime. So you only reboot it once for, even though you're trying to manage it across two different clusters. Uh, and whenever you reboot one, you have to make sure the other one reboots because you need to make sure the VFs get installed on the host properly after a reboot. So a lot of issues there. Now, I don't necessarily expect OPI to solve all of these issues, or um, I think it's really just pointing to uh, the incre increased complexity with deploying with um, DPUs and IPUs. So anything that we can do to simplify and make it easier will definitely help. All right, next slide. All right, um, to echo what a lot of the other speakers have been talking about um, during these last day and a half um, is just the need for common APIs, common tools, and a common ecosystem. Um, with all this additional complexity, um, it's gonna be impossible to manage if we have to duplicate that complexity for every vendor, for every solution out there. Uh, it's just impossible. There's no way to do it. It's gonna have to be upstream. It's gonna be, have to be open. Debugability is gonna be key. Um, as I kind of talked about a little bit with the, with the OVS flows being offloaded to hardware, um, now we have another layer um, to deal with. Um, are my packets flowing? from the host to the DPU. Once I'm on the DPU, are they making it into OVS? Once I'm on OVS, are they going into hardware offload or not? Um, anything we can do to increase debugability is gonna be key. And um, we need to keep um, complexity out of the applications. Um, but to take that a step further, we need to take the complexity out of the deployment as well. Um, when we deploy just a generic application, it doesn't have to know, it shouldn't have to know whether or not it's running on a DPU or not, or IPU. Um, and um, obviously, uh, we're in the, I was talking about how we integrated some of the stuff, integration is already happening. So um, I think OPI um, needs to move fast, um, need to have a set of concrete use cases and try to define um, APIs and ecosystem around it, not get bogged down in every detail. Um, I don't, I'm not saying that we need to skip steps. We don't need to skip Tom's testing that he talked about. We don't need to skip, you know, we need to do everything and define it right. But um, I think OPI is already behind the eight ball because these things are out there. Um, vendors have spent a lot of money trying to get these DPUs and IPUs, and so they're gonna want return on their investment, so they're trying to sell them already. So we have a, a, a big, a lot of work to do in front of us. Chris? Yeah, so um, 
we didn't come here talking about the complexity and how complex this is as like a downer to this ecosystem. We really came because we're saying we need the community to come together and help us build this right, right? We're doing things in OVS. We need other vendors. We need other software companies to come and help us and make sure that we're doing this in a vendor agnostic way. We tried. We tried to architect it in a vendor agnostic way, but we only have so much resource. So we need input from others. So it's not just what OPI creates for code itself, but also the integration into the other communities that are going to be part of this, whether it be Kubernetes, whether it be OVS, whether it be Linux itself. Um, we need to make sure that we are working together and talking about some of this um, so that we can go to those projects and have sort of a unified view of how this works. Because I can tell you that a lot of these communities aren't going to want to hear 10 different ways of doing this from different points of view, from different vendors, right? So if we can work together in this community to build common ways of doing this, even outside of the code we produce ourselves and figure out common ways to integrate the pieces together, that will reduce the complexity for working with these open source projects, but it also will help us to ensure that this complexity doesn't get passed onto the users. We need to make sure we work on making this simple, simple to deploy, simple to use, simple for applications, because otherwise nobody will use this, right? So this is really a call to action of we need to work together, um, we need to build this community, and we need to make sure we're doing it in a way that it will be successful. Otherwise, we risk that this entire ecosystem could end up locked into a couple companies solutions or solutions provided by, you know, hyperscalers. And I think the broad community loses then. And that's, I think, what I had. So um, probably open it up for questions now. Great. We have a whole bunch of questions for you guys. Oh, great. <laughs> okay. So um, let me pull these up here. All right, so um, hang on here. Okay, among the list of challenges that you listed, SRIOV, hardware offload, version, ma version management, lifestyle management, which are the most critical? All which of them? Is the most, yeah, I mean, they're all, I mean, it's not gonna work if any one of them are broken. Um, so I, I don't know if one's more critical than the other. Um, I think, at least for us right now, the most difficult one is going to be the life cycle management. Um, however, um, I think they're all important. Okay, next question. Are you using TC or DPDK for hardware offload of OVS flows? We are using TC. Great. Do you see value in OVS offload without SRIOV? That is, are there host side applications that will never adapt to SRIOV? So we are using SRV as our medium for getting the packets off the DPU and into the container. So whether or not they take advantage of the SROV, I'm not sure if I understand the question directly, but I mean, they don't necessarily have to take advantage of the speeds or different aspects of it, but it's, it's kind of what we're using to plumb into the SRV pod, the pods themselves. Okay, great. And if that didn't answer your question, you rephrase it and I will try to uh, answer it better. Okay, great. Okay, next question. Do you see RHEL running on the DPU as a hard requirement for the foreseeable future? I can take this one, Billy. Um, I don't think RHEL is a hard requirement. I believe that Linux, um, or at least an open OS, is going to be a pretty vital component for this ecosystem. I mean, if you really want to be able to have, not have the challenge of having different OSs between you know, your host layer and your um, infrastructure layer, as well as being able to integrate with a lot of the existing open source projects in Linux, I think Linux is an important piece here. Um, RHEL is not necessarily a hard requirement. We, we understand that other um, companies will use other Linux distros. I do believe that having a supported distro is a hard requirement for a lot of customers. Um, we heard some of the others talk earlier about how, you know, for like a telco to deploy this, they need support of that software, right? Which 
the OS running on these devices is going to need support. They're going to need security updates. It's going to need to come from a vendor that they know will provide those, will be doing all the right testing and integration um, with the other components. So I don't see RHEL as a hard requirement, but I do see a supported probably Linux distro as being a pretty good requirement for users. Okay, great. Did you look into zero trust of the host and move everything networking related to the IP to the DPU? Zero trust meaning that the host is not allowed to provision anything networking related. So initially we did not do zero trust, um, but that is the plan. Um, the DPU, I mean the the host. Um, itself does not have any communication with the DPU. Um, on the DPU, we have OVN that is more in the cube API server on the host, so it knows how to plumb the networking, but that is all through um, the cube API, and so we are not, there's no communication channel there. Also, keep in mind that what we've done so far is like a baby step of getting started, right? Um, one, because there's a lot to do, but also, you know, current generation car that we're using doesn't, isn't super powerful yet. There's new hardware coming from some of the vendors involved here and others, um, you know, that we think will be more powerful and be, will be more capable of running entire subsystems in the future. Um, but this is, this is a journey and we just barely, um, barely stepped over the line. Right. Um, so. Right. More to come. Um and, and, and we need to work with more of you guys to figure out, you know, is the way we did it the right way or do we need to make changes and how could that integrate, right? Right, totally agree. And um, right, this is not production code, this is dev preview. Um, we still have a long way to go. So um, this is our first step. And, um, and as Chris said, we, we, we tried to do everything open in the community. We did everything um, in the OVN and OVN Kubernetes community. However, we only had one sample set. Um, and so um, we tried to make it as common as we thought it could be, but we definitely with one sample set is impossible. So um, we know it's not there yet. Great, next question. Can you expand with examples and mitigations for your requirement to keep complexity out of applications? I can take a first step and then I'll let you have it, Billy. Um, the first comment I would make is that um, the application, having a common API for applications to code to is going to be important. I realize that in some cases, some really specific hardware things might not be common across vendors, but where possible, having that API that makes it easy to code to is going to be important. Um, I would give um, GPUs as an example, right? Um, the way the software ecosystem has evolved around GPUs has been interesting. There is a lot of software lock-in to CUDA because CUDA was an API that was created that made it a lot easier for um, upper layer applications to code to it, right? But now because that is a vendor specific API, all the software written to CUDA is locked into using NVIDIA GPUs, right? Think of what we want to accomplish is creating a API layer like CUDA for DPUs, but have it be open and have it be flexible and have it be portable across vendors. Did you want to add anything more, Billy? Um, yeah, I guess the only thing I would add um, in some of what we're working on or we've been playing around with, um, you know, I, what we don't want is, um, so example, we do a lot of daemon sets. And so I'm going to deploy um, a daemon set and I, you sh don't, shouldn't have to go in and create one daemon set to run on, uh, let's say DPUs and one daemon set. So you don't have to run the DPUs. What I want, what we want to be able to do is just say, hey, go deploy this and it just works. You don't have to have special um, either logic, whether it's a, trying to deploy the, depl the, the, um, the daemon set itself or replica set or not, it should just work. Is kind of some of the areas that we've been looking at too. Okay, great. We had a follow up on the zero trust question. Um, how would Kubernetes master and, and kubelet work in a zero trust scenario?
how would the uh, Kubernetes master and the uh, Kubelet work in that scenario? So in the um, DPU, we have OVN talking to um, Kubelet on the on the um, tenant cluster. Is that what I think that's what you're asking? Is is what is is how is that communication? And he's going out through the uplink and into the network to talk to him. Sorry, I wish this were live. It's hard to yeah, ask it's hard questions to... back and forth. So yeah, um, okay. Let, let's uh, see if we can engage in that in a chat. Moving, okay, that would be great. This. Um, next question is, do you use separate host mode and embedded mode for Bluefield? Um, no, we use it as, and I got to remember which mode it is. I want to say it's uh, embedded mode, but I, I need to double check that. But they're all okay. deployed the same. Okay, so that was the last question. Um, I do want to encourage you, there has been a whole email chat back and forth with folks about SRIOV, so I encourage you to take a look at that and pile in as you as you see fit. Um, with that, I want to uh, thank both uh, Billy and Chris for, for uh, leading us on this conversation, and we're going to go take a break.